bearings for the future. And last week we looked at John Wesley and today we're looking at John Knox and next week we're looking at Robert Brown. John Knox was born in around 1514. It could be as early as 1505 and as late as 1515. So that's in dispute. But he, we do know he died in 1572. That's him. He was a sharp-eyed, long-bearded, frail Scot. He, we'll find out more. He, he, he quote, here's a few quotes. He, he said, One man with God is in the majority. A man with God is always in the majority. And that's how he acted his life. He stood before kings and queens and in front of armies without showing any fear. He was a man who believed God was with him. He was a prayerful man. He said, Lord, give me Scotland or I die. What a yearning he had for his home country. Have you got that for Australia? I hope so. He also said, let no day slip over without some comfort received of the word of God. So in other words, dig into the Bible on a daily basis. That'll be your strength for life. It was amazing strength for this man when we find out what he went through, one of our founders. He was born in Haddington, and there it is, just east of Edinburgh. Uh, the French coast is just across the channel, and where he lived on a farm was under constant attack by French raiding parties. So he grew up looking over his shoulder, knowing that things weren't always peaceful. Not far from Glasgow... <laughs> Right there, there's a picture of the old bridge in the middle of the town. We don't have much information about his early life before 1540. We know that his mother was a Sinclair, and sometimes when John Knox was in trouble, he'd call himself John Sinclair. His father's name was William Knox, and they were most likely farmers. We believe they were farmers, but William Knox spent some money, even though he was relatively poor, to give his son an education because he thought that's the only way this family is ever going to advance is to get one of my sons to have an education. He was also a soldier. He fought in the Battle of Flodden with his two grandfathers. Both his grandfathers were killed. That battle was against Henry VIII's Protestant troops at that stage. Uh, that changed for uh, John Knox as time went by but you just have to imagine how the battles were in those days. You've read or seen Braveheart. They were blood-curdling days, and that's what he grew up in. Knox's initial priesthood training in the Catholic Church was under a scholar called John Major. It was most probably at St Andrews University. He took orders in 1540 with the Catholic Church, and in 1543, history tells us he was an apostolic notary in the Haddington area. So far, I'm, I'm guessing his life was just unfolding how he thought it would. He'd had no enlightenment. God hadn't knocked on his door. And his life was just unfolding. He was obviously a seeker. He wanted to be a Catholic priest. So something about him turned his heart towards God. But Luther's books were illegally smuggled into Scotland. Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the wall in 1517 on the Wittenberg church door, opening such an amazing light, shining such an amazing light on the Catholic church. And so Knox was born around about that time that Martin Luther was nailing those theses to the wall. So the Reformation was dawning. We have three men in the story, really. We've got... Patrick Hamilton uh, under James V, then George Wishart, both those men got burnt at the stake, then Queen Mary, the Bloody Mary, Queen of Scots, came along trying to get rid of all this Protestant Reformation and stamping the Catholic image back on the Scottish nation, but she came up against John Knox, and we'll find out what happened. Out of that came a lot of amazing writing that's very relevant to our church, the Knox Confession, which we study and folds into the, what the Uniting Church believes, the King's Confession and the Nine Articles of Perth. So good theology rolled out of this and 
some of it took just days to put together. We'll have a look at that. Later on, of course, around the 1600s, you got Andrew Melville. And Scotland needs another reformation today. I wonder if anyone here is the preacher that's going to turn Scotland on its head. So let's go back to Patrick Hamilton and the build-up to the story of John Knox. There he is, a very dear man. When John Knox was about 20, Archbishop Beaton had Hamilton burnt at the stake and he was accused of having private meetings with students in St Andrews University where he promulgated Luther's teachings. So Luther's teachings were outlawed. They were anti-Catholic and they were for the Reformation. Reformation. We don't want to have a church with the form only. We need a reformation. And so a church with the form only but not the power of God is just an empty shell. So we're not into that. So here's Patrick Hamilton. He paid the price. He was taken away on a trial, a sham trial. He, it lasted just hours. And that night they took him and tied him to a stake and burnt him. And he had a chance to recant, but he didn't. What men of God were these? What drove these men? I lay in bed late last night, early this morning, thinking, Lord, what grace did they have to be able to go through this? Well, they had the grace of the Lord Jesus, the same grace that you and I have, and if we needed it, we'd have it. There they were. So after his death, a man called George Wishart came along. That Wishart name, I think, originally was Wiseheart. Wiseheart. So Cardinal David Beaton, now a different cardinal, a nephew of the one that killed Hamilton, uh, sent a priest to kill George Wishart with a dagger. And Wishart disarmed him, took the dagger, and the crowd wanted to kill this priest, and Wishart defended him, looked after him, love your enemies. What a time these times this was. Now enters John Knox and John Knox really was taken with Wishart he linked up with him, he travelled with him and then finally he became his bodyguard Wishart uh, was a man that if you linked yourself with him you really did put a big target on your chest to say martyr me because this was right against the Catholic kingship and royalty that ruled Scotland at the time so Knox became deeply involved in the inside workings of Protestantism and here he is working as a guard to protect George Wishart. He had a big two-handled sword and at that time they referred to him as Sir John uh, Knox because not because he was knighted but because he had done his education but couldn't afford the degree, the piece of paper. So if you've done your education you were called a Sir but that didn't mean to say that you were a doctor or he didn't have the diploma on the wall, but you had it in title. George Wishart was a dear man. No wonder John Knox loved him. When the plague broke out in Dundee and people were dying everywhere, it was George Wishart that went down there and comforted them, preached to them, evangelised them, got them saved. He said... There's a disease worse than the plague. It's called sin. And the Lord Jesus Christ will save you from it. And here he is, a picture of him under that big archway which still exists, I believe. Finally, his life came to an end. He survived a number of attacks by Beaton before finally being arrested near Edinburgh in 1546. And when Beaton came to arrest Wishart, John Knox pulled out that big sword and was prepared to defend him to the death. So, two men, two brothers in arms. But Wishart said to John Knox, Nay, return to your bairns, your children, and God bless you. One is sufficient for a sacrifice. It's no use us both dying. He more or less handed on the mantle to John Knox and said, You go, look after yourself. Keep out of trouble and preach this word. So they say if Knox had stayed with Wishart any longer, he would have been burnt that day in 1546 as a heretic. 
So Wishart was taken, as we said, to St Andrews, kept in prison, and at his mock trial, he was found guilty of being a heretic, even though he proved every single point that they accused him of wrong by going to the Bible. He was hanged and burned at the stake outside the castle. You can still go to that point and see his initials in the ground. And his, his preaching helped to cement Scotland together around this idea of a reformation, of a real experience with God. Not having priests and money and all sorts of things in between you and God, but a clear sky. And so this death actually furthered the spread of the gospel. It inspired John Knox. This, instead of discouraging him, it put fire in his belly. And he kept running with this message for another 30 years, continually dodging attempts on his life. So David Beaton, Cardinal David Beaton, the Archbishop of St Andrews who brought Wishart to the stake, was a dominant political force. He really was the ruler of Scotland at the time. And Wishart's execution, unknown to him, began a chain of events that would profoundly alter John Knox's life, the history of Scotland. Really, all three were wound up in the death of Wishart. So what happened was, after Wishart's death, some of the Protestant leaders got together and set out to revenge him. And they raided St Andrew's Castle successfully, and killed Cardinal Beaton. Actually, they brutally murdered him. They stabbed him numerous times and abused the corpse shamefully. I only say that because how would your theology handle that? How would you handle that? How would we handle that? I think we would have a bit of trouble with that. But the Reformation times were rough. Sometime after this event, John Knox wrote the history of the Reformation and writing about this assassination of the Cardinal, he said, these things we write merrily. He was glad to see this man go. It's almost a bit of Old Testament coming through, isn't it? It's interesting, I find. But those sort of things happened a lot. It was a terribly rugged time of history. In fact, during that hundred years, not one king or queen of Scotland lasted their life out. For a hundred years, every one of them got murdered one way or the other. So, three months after Wishart's burning, Beaton was brutally murdered by the Protestant conspirators in St Andrew's Castle down by the sea. Amazingly gruesome story, out of which the Presbyterian Church was birthed. Would we guess it? Could we write that story if we wanted to write the story, would we write it that way? Anyway, the, that rebel force that killed Beaton grew to about 200 and they had a preacher called John Ruff, appropriately named, and Henry Bull Navis, another leader, and they became increasingly impressed with John Knox. And John Knox gets noticed, but not only noticed, he actually put up his hand in certain areas which really thrust him into the limelight. One day a Romanist named Arnold was debating in the chapel and spoke about the Roman Catholic Church and called it the spouse of Christ. And Knox couldn't take it. He stood up and interrupted that speaker from the audience and he said that the Catholic Church is no spouse, it's a harlot. Well, there's no putting a sharper edge on it than that. Knox challenged the Romanists to debate him on that subject and the Arnold refused. The congregation, though, was really impressed and insisted that Knox express his views in a sermon on the next Sunday. Shall we invite him? So Knox did, didn't want to be a preacher. Actually, the story goes that he ran out of the place in tears. He couldn't face the thought of actually being a preacher, even though he'd had some theological training and so on. This was just too much for him. He didn't see himself as the leader, as the preacher. He was more the bodyguard. So, but in April 1547, he preached his first sermon from Daniel 7. We don't use these scriptures much. There's, we could. The ten horns are ten kings. Who shall arise from this kingdom? And another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings 
He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times in the law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. Most of us would read that and think, I'll read the next bit, because we may not understand that. In those days it had meaning from, for example, for the reformers, the first person to take the see of Peter, the Catholic Pope, if you like, was 257, Stephen I, I think. And if you take time, times and half a time, one time, two times and half a time, or 1,260 years, because one time is 360 years, so three and a half times 360 is 1,260, 257 plus 1,260, 1517 the beginning of the Reformation. So they saw things that we don't see. They look at things that we don't read. I, I, I find that fascinating. I wonder what they think about our preaching today. I wonder what they think about the scriptures we use on a Sunday. I wonder what we'd think about the ones they used. We'd sit there and think, I don't like this church. Strange, isn't it? Don't you think? Anyway... He called the Church of Rome the Antichrist and highlighted the scandalous lives of some of the bishops and popes. That very man that killed Wishart had a number of girlfriends and ten children and he lived openly like that. He was no follower of the word of God at all. And so this man, John Knox, brought them to account. He preached that justification is by faith alone, not by works of human righteousness. New concept, new idea. Faith alone? I thought you had to do nirvanas, crawl up steps, whip yourself, put yourself in pain and pay the price for your sins. No. John Knox was preaching reform theology. Faith alone. The reception of this first sermon convinced him that he did have God's call on his life to preach and from that time forward he never ever doubted it. But things were to take a bad turn in that castle where those men were holed up, and they didn't know it, but the French were gathering their Catholic troops to come back and retake that castle and to layer Catholicism back over that part of Scotland. And they did. They came, and in July 1547, they took the castle, and the people inside surrendered, and Knox and 120 others were taken captive and made into galley slaves. And that was the cruelest, cruelest thing. They worked 24 hours of the day. They were under guard and a whip. They were bound to the oars. They couldn't go anywhere. 24 hours a day they sat there with those oars. They were given a ration of one ship's biscuit and water, sometimes as little as 85 grams or three ounces of food a day. He went in there a strong man. If he hadn't, he wouldn't have survived, but his his health deteriorated during this time. One of those little cans of tuners about what they had per day in terms of weight of food on pulling these big ships with oars. He was 33 year old and robust health when he began, but had he not been robust, he wouldn't have survived. They were 19 months of cruel, hard labor, and during that time a priest came on board with a painted image of the Virgin Mary to kiss. And Knox said, Trouble me not, such an idol is accursed, and therefore I will not touch it. So they forced him to take the icon in his hands and then pressed it against his face, and he tore it away and threw it over the side of the ship and said, Let our lady now save herself, she's light enough. Let her learn to swim. So he had, you know, he's like the little boy when they told told him to go into the corner and sit down. And he thought to himself, I might be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. This was John Knox. One day they anchored, and he could see the very church where he preached his first sermon. And one of his companions looked at him thinking he was dying, because at this stage his robust health had deteriorated. And he said... Do you think you'll ever preach in that chapel again? And Knox is reported to have answered, By the grace of God, I will yet again preach there. 
how difficult is the situation that you're in right now, that you're chained to, you can't see a way out of, it's heavy labour, you're locked in a swamp of surge and darkness and dankness in the bottom of a ship. Can you say, by the grace of God, I will yet again rise and overcome? You need to, because you'll face trials and troubles. I trust never ones like this. But we all face trials and we have to be able to look and see God and say, we will rise again. So the time came in 1549, a prisoner swap was arranged by King Edward VI. If you ever want to study an amazing king, have a look at King Edward VI, a young king, just in his teens he died, but he took England into Protestantism. He espoused it. He loved the Lord. He was a most godly king of England, John Knox called him, and eventually John Knox was led out under this man's leadership, this boy's leadership, and he was... Not John Knox was his chaplain for a number of years until this king was killed, poisoned at the age of 15. So that put Knox on another journey. In the year following the king's death, Knox became a spokesman for the Reformation in Scotland. He had a period of imprisonment and exile on the, in Europe and in Switzerland and places like that. As a matter of fact, he met Calvin when he was in this situation. We'll talk about that in a sec. So he supervised the preparation of the constitution and liturgy of the Reformed Church of Scotland, the Presbyterian Church. So after 10 years in voluntary exile, as I said, in Germany, Switzerland and France, with occasional trips to England and Scotland, Knox returned to his very troubled homeland and the next year personally led the Reformation forces to a military victory. There's a crossover somewhere here between political activism and deep-seated belief in the Bible. And while he was in Geneva, as I said, he ran into John Kelvin. And we talked last week about how John Wesley used to f fight with George Whitfield over Calvinism. So I've never entered into that dispute. But basically it goes something like this. Calvinism says that we're predestined to be saved. Predestined. And so... People might argue, well, if we're, if we're predestined, why do we pray? Why, why bother even trying to please God? If we're predestined, we're going to make it anyway. So that's extreme Calvinism. On the other hand, Wesley would argue, and later people like Finney and so on would argue that we have a free will. God doesn't want people that are conscripts. He wants people that are coming with choice. And so this big battle between predestination and choice goes on. And this scripture that is on both sides of the argument and that they, they are held in tension but I don't really believe that we ought to be arguing with each other over it. It's by choice. We are free will. Of course. John Wesley would argue that. Knox would say that the Bible says we're predestined. God had us pointed out. He had us chosen from the beginning of time. Are they really conflicting or can they go in parallel? That's the argument. So anyway, the Protestant theological system of John Calvin developed Luther's doctrine of justification by faith alone into an emphasis on grace alone, grace of God, and centres on the doctrine of predestination. Predestination was really important to John Knox. And the Scottish church was very austere Still is, in a way, I had a Presbyterian pastor for 36 years and I felt some of that austerity, that strictness. It's described as having a very austere moral tone. Much of that tone came from John Knox's input. And the governmental form, though, within the Scottish for Church was very democratic. That also came from John Knox. And then Calvinism became strong, obviously, in the Church of Scotland, in the Presbyterian Church. And the queen comes back from France. She's a delicate queen, a pretty queen, a, quite an attractive woman, turns up in Scotland. She didn't want to come back from France because being royal in France gave her so many benefits. But they sent her back to take Scotland back into Catholicism. And so she had these lavish parties and the 
hierarchy would come and people liked it because she did things well and she had this sexy accent that had a bit of French in it. She was quite attractive. So she comes back and, you know, people can get wooed one way or another, not John Knox. John Knox started talking about her. He started calling her to account for having secret Catholic masses and she didn't like it so she got him arrested and brought to court and he said, I'm standing in the presence of God. One man in God is a majority. It didn't faze him and instead of being intimidated he preached the gospel to her and history says Mary wailed like an animal under the power of his preaching. He was tried for treason and acquitted, thankfully. But she wouldn't give up. She said, that man made me weep and shed never a tear for himself. I will now see if I can make him weep. But he was acquitted. And that night, history tells us, she sat in darkness and alone, having a pity party. John Knox upset this queen. Mary, Queen of Scots, it said, trembled whenever John Knox went on his knees to pray. He was a praying man. He was a praying man. Change your situation by praying. She even once said that she'd rather face the armies of England than the prayers of John Knox, whom she both hated and feared. Here we have these great men of this age. People like Cramner, of course Latimer, Tyndall, Luther, Calvin and Swingley. All these great reformers following in the steps of Luther. And what did they preach? They preached reformed theology. So if you've been for centuries in a family of Catholicism, when this comes along, it's light. It's joy. Sola Scriptura, Solus Christus, Sola Gratia, Sola Fide, and Soli Deo Gloria. Scripture alone. Not all the stuff that the Catholic Church is putting on you. Christ alone. Not priests being mediators. Grace alone. You don't have to work it out. It's grace. Faith alone. You can have faith yourself in the God above and it's all for the glory of God alone. That reformed theology. That actually, that message still reforms our hearts. He also believed in tota scriptura, not just sola scriptura. Tota scriptura, everything in the Bible is God breathed. It's all relevant. It's all precious and you've got to take all of it from the front to the back before you decide on a course of action and a decision about life. So his preaching of Christ alone brought revival in Scotland and revival brought upliftment and literacy increased to over 90% in a country that never had people reading, that never had books, never had a Bible his work brought the literacy rate in Scotland to a level that some countries aren't anywhere near even today. 90%. Catholicism had kept the country in darkness, told people they can't read the Bible. They wouldn't understand it if they did. Anyway, they put together the Scots Confession. You'll smile at this. And so they tried to proscribe what a church would look like and they wrote what's called the Scots Confession, which we still study in our church. And they had six men to do it. John Knox, John Winram, John Spotswood, John Willock, John Douglas and John Rowe. You had to have John in your name before you could be on this team. And the six of them put together the Scots Confession of Faith in four days. Isn't that amazing? I can't imagine that happening in the Uniting Church. <laughs> so... What about his preaching? Well, he was a man that liked to unravel a subject. He started at the beginning, he finished at the end. He followed one text, one book, and he'd go through the book. He wasn't very topical. He wouldn't talk about a topic. He'd go through the Bible and unravel all the truth that was in it. He wasn't necessarily good at preaching doctrine. There was a place, he said, for both, but he liked to unravel one text. He was a sequential reading and exposition minister, took the scripture and unravelled it as he went. He believed in the plain interpretation, not deep theology. You can get so deep you get drowned. He liked stuff that was simple, usable, able for 
to, for the population to take it and be blessed. Catholics said to the population, you're not qualified to read the Bible, so therefore we'll keep it in Latin. He, along with the reformers, brought the plain scriptures to the people and gave them a plain interpretation. He was Christ-centred. He focused on the work and person of Christ. He called the church to Jesus, not the Pope. This is radical. Not so much for us, we don't even think about it. But for the day, this was radical. Christ alone. No, no, you don't need a preacher. You don't need a priest. You don't need people to intervene for you. You don't need saints or Mary. You can approach God through the name of Jesus yourself. And he challenged the church. Who is our head? Is it Jesus or is it the Pope? This was his message. He talked about having no other sacrifices. He preached till his dying day. He was on his deathbed. He raised up and preached about the crucifixion of Jesus. He died really an old man, but he was only 58. But his life was tough and long in terms of the things that he went through. So what can we learn? I haven't got it here. I just want you to know that in history he's recorded as being the most gentle pastor to his own people, to the people that were under his ministry, in his church, in his group. He was the most gentle, beautiful pastor. He was the opposite of that when it came to things that were going to affect his church. He had a ministry of encouragement. He said, Stand with Christ Jesus in this day of battle. This is a, a, a snippet. Which shall be short and the victory everlasting. For the Lord himself shall come in our defence with his mighty power. He shall give us the victory when the battle is most strong. And he shall turn our tears into everlasting joy. He was an encourager. He wouldn't be broken. He saw others burnt at the stake. Was a galley slave for 19 months. His captors tried to get him to kiss a cross. He fled to Switzerland away from home. He saw a king get poisoned. Had Bloody Mary chase him down. But he remained solid and true and we know this saying, it's not the size of the dog in the fight that matters, it's the size of the fight in the dog. And he had plenty of fight. He was an amazing man. Fear did not control him. When he was buried, a man stood there and said, here lies a man who in his life never feared the face of man. We need to draw from our founders. That's why we're teaching on these things. He honoured and perfected preaching. In the opening up of his text, he was moderate for about half an hour. This is a report. He used to preach quietly and, and like a teacher. And then he got to the part where he wanted to apply those scriptures. And it says here, one report, he made me so grew, shudder, and tremble that I could not hold a pen to write my notes. Melville Another man said, Knox once had to be lifted up into the pulpit. He was so tired and weak. Lifted up into the pulpit where it behoved him to lean at his first entry. But before he had done with his sermon, he was so active and vigorous that he was like to ding that pulpit in blads and fly out of it. I love that. He's on record as having broken two pulpits with his hands when he's preaching. Others resented it. So he was a man of the word. Testimony of Scripture, he said, is so plain that to add anything was superfluous. Take the word of God. Were it not that the world has almost now come to that blindness, that whatsoever pleases not the princes and the multitude, the same is rejected as doctrine newly forged and is condemned for heresy. We have the same problem today. People say, it can't, that can't be what the Bible says because we don't agree with it. So that must be bad doctrine. And you're a heretic whereas it comes straight out of the Bible, but society doesn't agree with it. So these things that he espoused, Christ alone, faith alone, grace alone, writing to a lady called Mrs. Bowers, there's a report, a letter, it said this. Listen, this is encouraging. Writing to a Mrs. Bowers, he said, your imperfection shall have no power to damn you, for Christ's perfection is reputed to be yours by faith, which you have in his blood. God has received already at the hands of his only Son all that is due for our sins, and so cannot his justice require or crave any more of us other satisfaction or recompense for our sins. He preached that. We preached that. That's the answer. That's the gospel. Jesus paid it all. The travesty, really, of this whole story is that the Scots hardly recognise him. 
He lies under car park 23 outside St Giles Church, buried in a very plain, almost unmarked grave. Cars park on top of him. This great reformer, this great man who started the Presbyterian Church, this great man who brought light to Scotland, lies in a place like that, and I believe that's a shame. But we can take so much from this man. Let us be brave. Let us trust God. Let us look at our trials in perspective. Let us understand that we are saved by grace alone and we get through life by faith alone and our head and leader is Christ alone. Amen.